is enter into God's promises. Before we get into the word, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can, can buy out the time and spend time in your word. Thank you that your word speaks life to our hearts. And I pray this morning as your truth goes out that it will, it will cancel out the lies of the enemy and our lives will be changed and transformed and renewed as we hear the hope of the gospel and the good news of Jesus. We honor you in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. So this section we're in, Joshua 4 and 5, in the time of history, it is after the 40 years of wandering in the desert, when the Israelites eventually get to the promised land. Get into the edge of the promised land and they are getting to the river Jordan. Moses is dead and Joshua has taken over the leadership of Israel. Now, all those who have been unfaithful, not wanting to go into the promised land 40 years before, has now died out. All except Joshua and Caleb, who were already ready to take hold of the promised land. Now, as they get to the River Jordan, they again face an obstacle the same as their parents, their fathers, faced at the Red Sea. There was a body of water preventing them from crossing into that which God has promised. This time Moses wasn't there. There was no staff to put in the water. This time it would be the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God that would split the water as the priests stepped into the water. So as they touched the water, the Jordan opened up and they crossed over in dry land. Now in this, God told them to take 12 stones from the middle of the river and to take it to the edge where they would move into the promised land and set up a memorial, a monument of what happened on the riverbank for generations to come. So they would commemorate how God brought them through the river into the promised land. So this is the background of what we are going to look at today. Now by now we know that this journey from Egypt to the promised land is a type of a person coming out of the sinful dead life, Egypt, and moving into the promises of God as we mature as believers, taking hold of God's promises. And this whole journey has a great impact on our identity, on who we are. And I'm so thankful that Becky is doing this class on identity this week as well. It's just going to expound on this. But it's so important to ground our identity in who God says we are. And in the section that follows, we will once again find important principles on how to enter into God's promises, which is tied to our identity. And we see that God revealed Himself to them with this miracle of Jordan, but then it elicits a response from them. Something has to happen. You see, many people today come to Christ, but they never take hold of the promises of God. How do we do this? You see, many people are still stuck in the lies of the enemy and it drains life from the soul. But I've come to Jesus, but I still feel life draining out of me. What is happening? How do I take hold of the promises of God? And see, when I'm talking about promises, I'm not talking about worldly uh, prosperity and all those things. Because there's no life in this. In that Jesus said, I came that you may have life and life in abundance. And that is not connected to money. It is something deeper. It is taking hold of the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That is life. How do we take hold of these things? And I believe we're going to find some insights in the word for this. So let's go to Joshua 4 and 5. We're going to start from verse 1. I'm going to skip a few verses just for time's sake. Uh, but we're going to start in verse 1 and um, go from there. Now, when all the nations had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, Take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them saying, 
Take up for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. Let's jump to verse 20. Those 12 stones which they had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. He said to the sons of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed. That all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Chapter 5. Now it came about when all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the sons of Israel until they had crossed that their hearts melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the sons of Israel. At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Make for yourself flint knives and circumcise again the sons of Israel the second time. So Joshua made himself flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Kabeath Haraloth. This is the reason why Jordan, uh, jo Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war died in the wilderness along the way after they came out of Egypt. For all the people who came out were circumcised, but all the people who were born in the wilderness along the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the sons of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, that is the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not listen to the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord had sworn that he would not let them see the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Their children, whom he raised up in their place, Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised along the way. Now when they'd finished circumcising all the nation, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. While the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover on the evening on the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. So on the day after Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land, so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that year. We're going to read up to there. God bless His wonderful word. The first thing we see is that you need to have an experience with God personally. You see, all these people, except Joshua and Caleb, have never been in Egypt. They never saw Egypt. They never saw the mighty hand of God moving with the plagues. And they never saw God splitting the Red Sea. These were things that God did for Israel so that they would see His might. He would show Himself strong so that He would show that He is the God Almighty revealing Himself to Israel. But they have never seen this. They were born in the desert. Now, they had to cross into the promised land although they were born in the desert. The desert was all they knew. And listen to this, even the manna which fed them every day might not even have been supernatural to them anymore. Can you imagine you are born as a baby and as you grow up every morning there is manna. It's as natural as rain. It isn't even a sign of God anymore. It's just the way that it is. It's just part of who we are. It sounds like religion. It's just part of who we are. But before they could enter the promised land, 
they would have to experience God for themselves. And for this to happen, they had to face a challenge for themselves so that God could show Himself strong to them. So that they can personally see who God is, see His greatness and see His power. Now, I remember when I grew up, I had the privilege to grow up in a Christian home with a mom and a dad that loved the Lord. And um, uh, I remember stories of they served in church and they prayed for people and many people were set free from, from the lies of the enemy and people came to Jesus. And it was just a wonderful place to be. And I remember people would just rock up at our house and come for coffee or tea or whatever. And before long, this would become a Bible study. And it would just become a testimonial moment. And it would just turn to Jesus. Everything, eventually when the children of God get together, you start to speak about Jesus, okay? And I would hear these things and all these wonderful stories. But you know what? There had to be a day where I had to choose to personally Become a child of God. Because the truth is, if you are born in a garage, it doesn't make you a car. If you're born in a Christian home, it doesn't make you a Christian. You have to experience God for yourself. And this is where we see that God reveals Himself. In chapter 4, He almost replicates the same Red Sea miracle at the Jordan. And we see why when God explains it. He says, this is why I'm going to do this in verses 22 to 24 of Joshua 4. Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea which he dried up before us until we had crossed, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Few important things from this section. Firstly, God could have brought them through the Jordan in a drier season. He could have brought them there that they could just easily wade through and go into Jericho, move on to Jericho. But God did this for their benefit. The Jordan was in flood. It was impossible to cross the Jordan. God had to do a miracle for their benefit so that their faith would grow so that they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is God. And not only that, that He was their God. See, and this would be a sign to them, but it would also be a sign to their descendants. Because their descendants would very rarely go back to Egypt. They would not see the memorials and the monuments at the Red Sea. But they would frequently come past this point. And when your kids are with you and say, Daddy, what is this all about? So you know what? This is to remind us that God brought us through the Jordan. By the way, we, it's a section that we skipped. They also had to make a pile of rocks in the middle of the Jordan where the priest stood. So that they could show this sign on this side and also show the sign of the pile of rocks in the middle of the river. Daddy, how did that get there? That's where God brought us through. And you know what he also did? He did that at the Red Sea as well. God does miracles over and over in every generation. It became a sign of what God has done. But then it says, if they will see the sign, it will stir a fear in them of God. Or more, a better way to say it is a reverent awe of God. God did that? Wow, God is great. That's amazing. It stirs a reverent awe of God, being reminded of His power. See, the thing is, it's important for every person to come to a place where they have a personal revelation of Jesus Christ. In our time, many times this happens when people are confronted with a difficulty or a challenge that you cannot handle on your own. God, why am I going through this? God, why are you allowing this? Why is this River Jordan in front of me? Why is this thing in flood? Because God can use these moments to turn your heart to Him and reveal Himself strong to you on a personal level. 
See, everyone needs a moment of wrestling with God. A great illustration of this is Jacob. You remember his story? So he deceived his brother. His bro brother in his heart made this commitment that as soon as his father dies, he will kill his brother. So Jacob flees, goes to work for his uncle who deceives him, by the way, long story. He comes back eventually, back home, with his wives and with his children and with his, his livestock and his, all his slaves and all the people working for him. But he's scared because he's going into this obstacle. What is going to happen? So what does Jacob do? He sends everyone ahead of him and he stays back alone with God. A personal encounter with God. And there he wrestles with God. And he wrestles with who he is. And he wrestles with his identity. And God shows him who he is. But it doesn't stop there. God then changes his identity and he shows him who he is going to become. You will no longer be Jacob. You will no longer be known as deceiver. Now you will be Israel. And there will be a descendants after you that will be great. See, God changes this when we have this personal moment with him. Isaiah 1, 18 to 20 says, Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord. You know what God is calling you to reason with Him? Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. If you consent and obey, you will eat the best of the land. That is God's heart for you. God's heart for each one of us is that we will eat the best of the land if we will just consent and obey. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Now, I like this word reason. I get the idea that God, to a certain extent, entertains our reasonings. You know, people can be so clever. When you come to God and you're reasoning with God, you have so many excuses. God, this is the reason that I'm living the way I'm living. God, you don't know my past. This is the reason. Oh, poor me. This is what happened to me. Oh, this is why I do this. This is why I am like this. Excuses. Reasons. But when you are reasoning with the truth, at some stage you need to relent to the truth. There is nothing that God does not know. There's a moment when you are faced with the truth of who you are. But you know what happens when God reveals himself to you and when Jesus reveals himself to you, he reveals himself to you as the merciful one. That's what we read just now. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins were as scarlet, they will be white as snow. He reveals to you his grace. He forgives you, He washes you, He makes you new. The real truth sets you free. And remember, we are on a journey to find what is God's identity towards us. What does God say over us? Because when I see the truth, it sets me free. Now what ties into this, the third result flowing from this event is that it would be a sign to all the peoples of the earth that God is the mighty one of Israel. And we see this in chapter 5 when it says that their enemies' hearts melted like wax and there was no spirit in them anymore because of the Israelites. It was almost as if the battle was futile. They were disheartened. What's the point of fighting against these people? Did you see what their God did? We thought the river would be a barrier to protect us. Oh my word, he brought them through the river on dry ground. What's the point of fighting against these people? And this is an important note for us to take hold of. When you come to Jesus Christ and he becomes your Lord and your Savior, Lordship 
Lord, your will be done and Savior, the enemy's heart melt like wax. Who is the enemy of your soul? A oh, wonderful, a few people know that. <laughs> Satan, the evil one. He is the enemy of your soul. He's the one that wants to destroy you. But the moment you come to Christ, his heart melts like wax because he knows the battle is already won by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. He has no power and authority over you anymore except that which you give him. When you believe what he says, it gives him power. That's the only power he has when you put your faith in his lies. See, faith works both ways. You can trust what God says about you and it brings life. Or you can believe what the enemy says about you and it brings death. Use an example. The enemy whispers in your ear, you're a loser, you will never make it. The moment that you, you make that thought your own, I am a loser, I will never make it. You have put faith in the lie of the enemy. And that lie has power over you. He doesn't have any other power to play with except lies. And you know what I told my kids from very young? I said, whenever a thought comes into your mind and it makes you feel icky and worthless and anxious, that is the enemy. And we know that he is the father of the lies. So whatever he says Exactly the opposite is true. Because he wants to destroy you. If he tells you you're a loser, you say, thank God you're saying that to me. Because I'm not a loser. Now I know I'm a winner. You're not going to make it. Oh, thank God you said that to me. Now I know I'm going to make it. Because you are a liar. You're a deceiver. This is important to take hold of. 1 John 4, 4 says, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He who is in you than he that is in the world. But I want to tell you, this isn't a magic chant that you give when you feel, when you feel sad or in fear. When you quote this verse, the enemy must flee away from you. No, it is something that must be a truth in your heart. It is something, a position that you speak from. When it has dawned on you this truth, greater is He that is in me. What? He is in me? The God of heaven and earth by His Spirit is living in me with the fullness of His power. I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. God is here. Nothing can stand against Him then that truth has become your truth. And then you can say, get behind me, Satan. You're a liar. Greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. It has to become revelational knowledge in your heart. Because see, here's the thing. We need to respond to God's revelation. It asks for a response. When God didn't just stop with this, God didn't stop with this miracle revelation, but He told them to do something. He told them to circumcise themselves. Now, what was the circumcision? For Israel, this was a sign of being in a covenant with God. Yet none of them in the 40 years have been circumcised. So here we see that God makes this a personal thing. He doesn't say, just pick one man from among you. I think let's vote for uh, Joshua. And let's circumcise uh, Joshua again. No, that's already been done. Uh, let's find someone else. Let's circumcise one of these men for all of you. He says, no. Each and every man has to be circumcised. It's a personal thing. And by the way, I don't think it was a fun thing. They made their own knives in the desert. With what? Flint. What is a flint? 
I don't know. It sounds like a rock to me. I don't know. A sharpened rock. Oh my word. I would have run for the hills. Say, oh no, this isn't happening. Yet I don't see any one of these men refusing. All of them said, yes, the will of the Lord be done. Why? Because they had a personal encounter with God. This wasn't just a religious thing that had to happen. This was a, God just brought me through the Jordan. I saw him pull this up. By the way, it says the river backed up all the way up to a town called Adam. There is another sermon on that. All the way up to Adam. Where did all the water go? In flood season? There is a God. And that God is for me. And I want him to, I want to be circumcised because then I know that he is my God. They also knew that they needed God. They could not fight the battles that were to come without him. Their strength was in him. There be giants in the land. See, this once again becomes a personal surrender for us as well. A surrender to God. We already have God's general revelation. Romans 1 speaks of this. It says that we see through nature what God has done. I'm not going to go into that because we know that it is foolish to say there is no God. And then he has written his word. God has spoken. And he has revealed himself through Jesus Christ that came. You know what's beautiful? That song we just, we just sang, uh, King of Kings. Morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. Stone was rolled for good for the lamb and conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs. And as we sang that, I thought, oh my word. The Bible says when Jesus was risen from the dead, other dead people rose with him. That is the power of God at work. Can you imagine? Auntie Aurora being dead for 100 years. Suddenly she stands at the door and knocks, hey, here I am again. No one could refute the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. There is power in the name of Jesus. And yeah, let's give God praise. Amen. And then we also know that God is true because He writes the end from the beginning. He says what will happen in the future and it happens. So He must be God. We have this knowledge. So by the way, God doesn't have to prove himself to you in that sense where you say, God, there's some water in here. If this doesn't become wine in five minutes, there is no God. Because God says, I have spoken. It is done. I have revealed myself. You may have to make a choice. See, this cannot stay head knowledge. Everyone needs a circumcision of the heart. God even promised this in the Old Testament. He said eventually, while, when believing in Christ, He would do that. Deuteronomy 36, He says, Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. It's God's plan, life. Paul pulls it through in Romans 2.29. He says, you know what? The Jews were circumcised on the outside, but their hearts didn't change. He says, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that which is of the heart. Done by the Spirit. Not by the letter. Not by the law. The Spirit of God does this. See, circumcision of the heart means to remove the cold, dead, calloused, stiff-necked, Part of the heart, which people hold on to in pride. This is my life. I want to do it my way. And when that is cut away, it results in a heart that is tender, a heart that is alive to God, living in surrender to His will and His purpose. A great illustration of this is, there's a book written by Nabil Qureshi, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Wonderful book. And it speaks of this, he was a young man who came to America, came to study, he was a devout Muslim. And he met some Christian friends. And they started to tell him about Jesus. 
And um, he got so angry at them that he said, I want to prove to them that Jesus is not the truth. So he went and he studied the Quran. And in the Quran, he found that it spoke of Jesus. Only a prophet, but a Jesus who did miracles in the Quran. Even Muhammad couldn't do that. Then he went to science and he studied the Bible and he started to look into all this until there was a moment where he had 100% certainty beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. But he said in that moment, although he had all the knowledge, he had to make a personal choice to surrender to Jesus. He says just knowing it didn't change my life. He said, I still wanted control of my life. But God was convicting and pulling me until I said, Jesus, I surrender. Be Lord of my life. And he was circumcised in his heart. Because the beautiful thing that happens with this is that you receive your identity. See, something happened with them when they were circumcised. Now they carried the mark of God on their bodies. This was their identity. I am now not a slave. I am a child of God. We are a chosen generation. We are special people. We are appointed. We are set apart. We are different than any other nation. Proud of the fact that we are the nation of the Most High God. And see, it speaks of the fact that they had lost their identity in the desert. Their fathers were supposed to tell them. Their fathers were supposed to circumcise them. To tell them, you know why I did this? Because you are a special people. Teaching them about who God was and who they were. But somewhere in the desert, this got lost because their fathers lost faith. See, the restoration of identity is God's plan for every person. Each and every one of us are made in the image of God to stand in relationship with Him just like God did with Adam and Eve. But then sin stole and corrupted this identity. And the restoration comes through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now many people today, even though they have come out of their sinful life, out of Egypt, their sinful walk, they still do not stand and operate in their new identity of who they are in Christ. And God wants to restore this, bring you into His promises so that you can stand with confidence as a son and a daughter of God. This is the aim. This is where we're going. How does this happen? Firstly, receive forgiveness. Now you can sit here and say, well, I've been saved for 20 years. I know the story of forgiveness. Jesus forgives my sins. Yeah, I know this. I'm going to shut down for five minutes until you say something interesting again. I want to advise you not to. Because there's something deep happening here. In verse 9, it says, The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Reproach in this context speaks of shame. The shame of your past. The shame of your time in the world. But not only the shame of your wanderings in the world, but also your wanderings in the desert. Because Egypt still followed them in the desert. It was their identity. It's why they couldn't take hold of the promised land. And there was the shame. The shame of the past. And I want to tell you, even times when you are a Christian, sometimes people stumble. They make mistakes. Not all these wonderful Christians. We're all perfect. Yeah. No. We all stumble. We all make mistakes. We look at ourselves and say, Oh my word, I cannot believe I did that. Other people once again. 
shame. See, God wants to remove all shame from you because shame has the effect that you want to hide. Afraid of what will happen if people see the truth. Afraid of even recognizing this in front of God. Surrendering it to God. What if God finds out, I'm not really such a good Christian? I want to tell you something, God knows everything. But the Bible says when we confess our sins, what does that mean? I come in agreement with what God says about it. That thing in my life that I'm ashamed of, I say, God, I know that you see this. God, you've shone your light on this, and I see this. But you know what happens when God shines His light on the dark recesses of your heart? He doesn't shine, shine to condemn and to destroy. He shines it so that He can heal and restore and forgive and make beautiful. How do I know this? It happens in the first few books of Genesis. Adam and Eve sins. What do they do? They go and make themselves clothes of leaves, fig leaves. So God finds them and says, where are you? What have you done? And then God strips away all the leaves and He hits them with lightning and they die. That's 2 Genesis 5, 7. <laughs> no. What does God do? We see His heart. He makes them new clothes. He makes the first offering and makes them clothes of skin, which becomes a representation and a type of Jesus who would come to wash away our shame with His blood, Him being the sacrifice. That's God's heart. Listen to this. Isaiah 54 verse 4 says, it's God speaking, Fear not, for you will not be put to shame. God, but I'm so scared. What if I don't make it? He says, you will not be put to shame. Do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced, but you will forget the shame of your youth. One thing I do, I forget the things that have passed, and I reach myself out to that which God has and take hold of it. Zephaniah 3.19 I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will turn their shame into praise and renown in the earth. God can even take that which you are ashamed of and He can turn it into praise. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was broken, but now I'm healed. I once was stuck, but now I'm free. That's moving into the promises of God. See, the effect of this is that we now have a new identity. And the identity is we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are in right standing because of what He has done. And we need to receive this truth. It cannot just be head knowledge. It must be something that you apply and say, Thank you, Jesus. That sometimes I still feel like a loser, but I know your word says, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's who I am. Because then God invites you to start to eat of the fruit. In verse 10 it says, after they were circumcised, they observed the Passover, which is what? A sign of Christ. You remember? They... Re they commemorated that, observed the Passover at Gilgal, which means rolling away. God has rolled away your reproach. And they ate some of the produce of the land. Something interesting happened. The manna stopped the day after they took the Passover. They no longer had manna. So, but what's going to happen now? Now they ate of the fruit of the promised land. Now they were eating from the yield of Canaan. And this was the promise. That was God's plan all along. Deuteronomy 11.11, 11, God says, said to them, The land in which you are about to cross to possess is a land of hills and valleys, drinks water from the rain of heaven. Listen to this. A land for which you care. 
No, the Lord your God cares for that land. The eyes of the Lord your God is always upon it. God is speaking of your promised land, of your new life. God cares for your new life. God is the one that's watching over it. From the beginning to the end of the year, it shall come about if you listen obediently to my commandments, which I'm commanding to you, to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and soul, that He will give rain for your land in its season. You don't even have to water the plants that you get the produce from. God is the one growing it. God is the one supplying it. The early and the late rain, that you may gather in your grain and your new wine and your oil. He will give grass in your fields for your cattle and you will eat and be satisfied. There's a deep spiritual application here. The moment they stepped into this relationship with God, commemorating the Passover, they started receiving from the hand of God the blessing from the land. God was watching over it and He was providing. So when we step into our personal relationship with Jesus, we step into the promised land of His provision and His Lordship over our lives. Let's pause here. This is very important. Knowing that Jesus is Lord, having a personal relationship isn't just a side note of Jesus. Yes, I know you're there. Thank you. And then I sweat and toil and make my own decisions and try and struggle through life alone again. No. He now becomes my provider. He becomes my sustainer. He becomes my guide. He becomes my comfort. He becomes everything that I need. And here's an illustration. Because we are called children of God. You agree? So we, I have children, blessed with three beautiful, wonderful kids. And when they were still babies, they weren't able to ask me what they want. Daddy, mommy, can we please have some formula milk? No. We fed them. We cleaned them, which wasn't always fun. Bathed them, clothed them. Give what they needed. As they grew up and they started to ask, we provide what they need. And it gives great pleasure to my heart when my kids need something and I can provide it and I see the joy on their faces. See, that's God's heart for us as well. He says, I want to live in that relationship with you. Ask of me. Speak to me. Yes, I know what you need, but it's wonderful to be in communication with you. He's my father. I'm his son. That's my identity. That's God's heart for us. See, we now live in the favor of the Lord. Not having to strive and struggle on our own, our own cares and worries. He says, bring your cares and worries to me. And see, this is a critical mindset change that needs to happen. He is now my life. He is my source. He is my exceedingly great reward. And to understand this and receive this is what it means to live grounded in our identity of who we are in Christ. He's my Father. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a... New creature, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And this is the beautiful promise we have in Him. And this is how we grow in our identity, in our journey. We find the promises of God in His Word. He has already spoken. We find these treasures. We find these truths. We find it in His Word. And as we study and receive it, it is applied to our lives and we eat from the fruit of the promised land. 2 Corinthians 1.10 For as many as are the promises of God, in Him they are? Yes. Say yes. yes. Therefore also through Him is our amen to the glory of God. See, when you start to live a life in the joy and the peace of God, it gives glory to Him. The moment that people see this, 
they glorify God. God is glorified. When people look at my kids and say, wow, you have such wonderful kids, it glorifies me. I say, well, it's by the grace of God, but you see, God is glorified through our lives. This is God's heart for us. That we would live in that unbroken fellowship with Him. Where we see victory over sin and death. We live in His purpose. We live in His promises guided and directed by His Spirit. You know what? There's a great illustration of this. I've used it before, but it's so powerful. And I want to share it again. Imagine there is a king. And this king has a daughter. But this daughter, one day when the king and the queen was going through the land, this daughter as a baby was kidnapped and abducted by the king's mortal enemy. And this enemy abused this child, spoke lies into this child's life, let this child live on the street, eating from the dustbins, scraping by, living a life of being defeated. But then one day, the king's army moves through the city and finds this child. Now this child has grown up, a teenager. This broken identity in her life. But the king is overjoyed and he takes this child and hugs her and tells her, I love you. You're my child. And he dresses her in these wonderful ball gowns and she lives in this new room and she's got all these servants and he provides what she needs. But at night she sneaks out and she goes and eats from the dustbin. And one day the king follows her and sees what she's doing and he says, what are you doing? She says, this is who I am. This is what I'm used to. This is all I'm worth. So the king has to start a process of wooing her with love, of telling her who she is, of showing her the privileges that she has now as a daughter of the king, an heir to the kingdom. And see, this is our story. This is the story of every person that is bound in the lies of the enemy, even angry at God. And God is wooing us back with His love. And bit by bit, He's revealing His truth. And as we take hold of the truth, it changes us. We say, can this be? And many times the old nature is still fighting and saying, no, 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 I'm not worthy. I'm so ashamed. God says, I want to set you free. I love you. I am for you. I'm not against you. I have blessed you. I have called you. I have chosen you. I have made you. Child, you are mine. Step into the promised land. Step into that which I prepared for you. And once again, we can easily say or think this is about prosperity and God giving me money. That's not what it's about. It's about life. True life. Jesus said, I came that you will have life. My life, my joy, my peace, the knowledge of who you are. Child. You are mine. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the revelation of your love that draws us in. Thank you that you came to capture our hearts, but not with force. You came to capture our hearts with love. And now our lives are changed. And I want to pray for every person this morning. Lord, that's still stuck in shame. 
stuck in the wilderness, stuck in lies. And Holy Spirit, I want to pray that you will just work your truth in our hearts. Because it's your truth that sets us free, that brings life. I want to come against the lies of the enemy that wants to destroy, wants to tell that you are worthless, you will do nothing, your life will come to nothing, or it is too late. It is too late to turn around. It's never too late. God is not done with you yet. This morning, I pray that Holy Spirit, you will come and bring hope and life and truth in the heart of every person sitting here, wherever we are on our journeys. Lord, we open our hearts to you and we want to come and pray, Lord, we just don't want to know and acknowledge that you are there. We want you to be Lord of our lives. Lord, that we can proudly say, I am God's property. I am part of His generation. I am a royal priesthood. I am part of a holy nation. I am set apart. The mark of God is on my life. I'm a prince. I'm a princess. I'm a child of God. If this morning you just want to say, and I'm, this is not about coming to Jesus the first time. This is just saying, Lord, thank you that you are my Lord. And I want you to reveal to me more and more your identity. I want to step into the promised land with you. Just raise your hand and say, God, here I am. Here I am. I'm available. Thank you that you do something new in my life. More and more and more. I surrender to you. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you do. In Jesus' name. Everybody says, Amen. Can we praise God for His loving kindness and His mercy? Hallelujah. Isn't He amazing?